very much for showing up. Um, it, there's been uh, we've really had a lot of interest in this event. It's been amazing seeing everybody sign up, and it's amazing seeing everybody turn up. So you know, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for Skills Matter for hosting us for and for, for stream for recording this, and uh, of course a big thank you to to Jeff um, and his team for for agreeing to to this talk. Um, so you know. This is organized as part of the, the London Deep Learning Meetup, which uh, Ali and myself uh, have been the organizers. Um, both of us representing Percentile, which is a, a, start, a new startup here in London offering machine learning and data science courses and training. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this is only our second meetup. Um, the first one was last month. Hands up who went to the first one? Ah, nice. So you know, that was a re really great meetup. Um, great talk by Piotr from Microsoft, uh, giving a nice intro. Um, we'll, we'll probably get him back at some point. Um, there's lots more interesting uh, meetups scheduled. I think after this is done, we can maybe give you a few, a few tastes of, of what's, to, what's to come. Um, anyway, back to the... Oh, Jeff, let's stop, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Back to the meetup. So today, I mean, we're really honored to have uh, Jeff Hawkins and, um, come present to us, uh, especially for us live from California. Um, maybe we can convince him to come down to London uh, next time. Um, so, you know, many of the many of you already know his name, but um, I'll just go through his bio. So, Jeff Hawkins is a, an engineer, serial entrepreneur, scientist, inventor, and author. Uh, he's founder of two mobile computing companies, Palm and Handspring, and was the architect of many computing products such as the Palm Par Palm Pilot and Trio smartphone. I think everybody's heard of those. Um, so throughout his life, Jeff has also always had a deep interest in neuroscience and theories of the neocortex. In 2002, he founded the Redwood Neuroscience Institute, a scientific institute focused on understanding how the neocortex processes information. So the inf institute is now still there, and it's uh, located at UC Berkeley. Um, in 2004, he wrote the book On Intelligence, which uh, some of you may have read, uh, which describes progress on understanding the neocortex. And in 2005, he founded Grok, which was formerly known as Numenta, a startup company building a technology based on neocortical theory. So the hope is that Grok will play a catalytic role in the emerging field of machine intelligence. And I think so far, it's doing pretty well. Um, Jeff originally has earned his uh, bachelor's in engineering, uh, electrical engineering from Cornell. And uh, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2003. Um, so Everybody, again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for Skills Matter and everybody hosting. And thank you very much for Jeff um, for willing to talk to us. And over to you. Oh, yeah, by the way, one, just one more thing. Uh, we all take questions at the end. There'll be a microphone that goes around. Thank you very much. All right, we all set. Uh, hi, I'm Jeff. I am sorry I'm not there in London with you in person. Uh, I do get over there occasionally. I have family in, uh, in Britain. But uh, I'm not there today, unfortunately. So hopefully this is going to work out right uh, well. Um, and uh, I, we have, I trust Ali and Matt here on the AV side. If something goes screwy and weird, well, hopefully they'll let us know and we can fix that. So I'm going to just talk about um, uh, the work we're doing at our company and in our open source project. And, uh, um, and as Ali said, that uh, we'll take questions at the end. Um, and uh, so we'll just uh, hopefully it'll go, on, go well. I unfortunately cannot see you uh, very clearly, and I can't judge how um, if things are going fast or slow, or if you want to get more information or less information on a particular topic. So uh, if there's something really going wrong and you really feel like I'm missing something, we'll let Ollie know, and, uh, and I'll be happy to try to go and address that. All right, so we'll start. Um, actually, Ali was close. We, we, are, we started this company with the name Numenta. We briefly changed it to Grok, but we're actually back to Nementa. So I'm sorry about the confusion of that. The name of a company is Nementa. Um, and our mission is to be a catalyst for machine intelligence. So you know, a catalyst is something that speeds reaction that's happening anyway, but it's going really slowly. So we're going to build intelligent machines. We as a society, uh, we're going to build intelligent machines. I have a different view than most people what those will look like. Uh, but we're going to build the intelligent machines. And Nementa is just trying to accelerate uh, that and, and be a positive force in that in that transition that's going to occur. We do three things in the Menta. Uh, we have a research group where we study neocortical theory and we do algorithms development. Then we have an open source community called NuPic, and all of our algorithms are in the open source uh, repository. 
Uh, and uh, this, I suppose, today's meetup is part of that open source effort. And then we do have a product group called Grok, or a product called Grok, which is less than a month old in the market. And um, this product is using our cortical algorithms, and we've applied them to streaming analytics. So I'll talk about uh, the research uh, a, a bit in this talk. I'll talk about Grok a bit to show you what we're doing with these cortical algorithms. And, uh, and then we'll end up a little discussion about NUPIC. So uh, that's my email address. And uh, don't be afraid to email me if, if you need to. Um, I try to stay involved. And I also am active in the NUPIC um, email list as well. OK, I'm going to start off with a, um, a story. And this is a story. Uh, about Bill Gates. When Bill Gates was still CEO of Microsoft, a number of years ago, he was speaking to um, a, young, a group of young students, uh, what we would call grade school. And one of those students asked uh, Bill Gates, he said, do you think it would ever be possible to build a company as large as, you know, as Microsoft, another company as large as Microsoft? Of course, this was before Google. But um, Bill had a, a very quick answer. He didn't hesitate. He said, yes. Uh, he, and he said, if you could build a company that if you can invent a breakthrough so computers that learn, can learn, that is worth 10 Microsofts. And what he was saying, that was a very smart answer. He was saying, basically, we've built computers on the same principles for 70 years. These are the principles laid down by von Neumann and Turing, programming principles. And he said, but you know, computers really don't learn. And, and figuring out how to make machines that learn is, is a, actually a bigger revolution than computing. And I agree with that. I thought it was a very astute thing. He said it right, off, right away. Um, Instead of talking about computers that learn, I talk about machine intelligence. I prefer that term. They're, they're kind of the same, but one has a, a broader vision to it. And a lot of people are becoming interested in machine intelligence these days. They haven't for a long time. Um, but you know, there's a lot of people uh, moving this direction. And, and I've been to lots of conferences from, from computer manufacturers, from applications areas, where people trying to figure out, people dealing with big data. You know, We need machines that can learn, that can adapt, and so on. Now, if you're going to build machines, uh, machine intelligence, you, you, you might ask a couple of questions. What is What are the principles we're going to use to build intelligent machines? Um, you know, how are we going to do that? What are the, how is this going to be structured? There's a lot of disagreement about this. The second question you might ask is, what applications will drive adoption in the near and the short term? Uh, and now, um, and then finally, well, you know my answer to these questions. Well, you know my answer to the first one. Uh, I'm interested in brains, uh, and I believe that machine intelligence is going to be built on the principles of the neocortex. Now, just to remind you, the neocortex is about 80% of the volume of a human brain. It's, uh, it's what makes you intelligent. All, all my language, your language, all high-level vision, planning, motor behavior, and so on is in the neocortex. And um, I believe that we need to understand those principles before we can build machines that are intelligent. The goal of, my goal and the goal of the mentor is not to build machines that are like humans. It's not to replicate the human neocortex. It's to understand the principles by which it works and then apply it to other problems uh, that are maybe not human-like at all. So it, this is not the, you know, to, to build a robot company, a human-like robot. This is a company to understand how the brain works and then build intelligent machines that work on those same principles. So um, there are a couple of reasons that, that recommend the brain for this or why we should think about the neocortex. One is it's an incredibly flexible organ. When you're born, you know, you know very little about the world, uh, almost nothing. Your neocortex is structured, but it has no knowledge about the world. And, um, and it's extremely flexible. You can learn to program computers, design computers. You can learn to drive cars and submarines and airplanes. You can learn uh, spoken language, any one of thousands of spoken language, mathematics and, and physics and so on. And, um, and so, um, so um, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to try switching back and forth here a little bit. Um, so uh, it's an incredibly flexible tool. These are things you, you can learn to do that you were never evolved to do. You were under evolutionary pressure to do. So it's as close as we know to a universal learning machine. In the same way that Turing talked about a universal computing, uh, the, the cortex is as close as we know to a universal learning machine. It's not proven mathematically that that's the case, but that's one thing. The second thing is that the neocortex is very robust. Uh, it's built of very simple elements that are slow and unreliable. So the neurons and the synapses in the brain are, are fairly unreliable elements. None of them work uh, particularly well. Yet together, we have a very, very robust system. There are no single points of failure. And so as we think about going forward in the world in terms of um, uh, building you know, new computer hardware that, uh, that for machine intelligence, this is a very desirable property. People can build memory arrays and so on that are naturally fault tolerant. And then, but there's still quite a few people who don't believe that 
machine intelligence is going to be built on the principles of the, of the brain. They're, they're people just do not care about the brain. In fact, I think this my, this my opinion might still be a minority opinion. But um, I can say the following. If we knew how the neocortex worked, um, then there would be no, there would be a race to build them. If we had a theory written down about exactly how the neocortex works, I don't think anyone would be sitting around arguing about it. We'd be off building the things. And fortunately, that's where we're starting to be. We're starting to really deeply understand how the neocortex works, and we're starting to build them. And I think this debate about whether brains are relevant or not will disappear in the coming years. Okay, so now we're going to jump into some, some neuroscience, uh, just to tell you a little bit more how brains work. And um, here's an here's a, a, a overall picture of what the cortex does. Uh, it receives information from your senses, and the retina is really like an array of senses. It's not one sense, it's a million sensors. The cochlea in your ears are about 30,000 sensors each, and your somatic sensors or your body sensors are about another million. So you've got a couple million sensory bits coming into the brain. They're streaming in. They're, they're, it's not batched up in any way. And, and the cortex, as I said, starts not, not, really, not really knowing anything, and it has to learn a model of the world. So from the sensory stream, it builds a model of the world. And from that model, it makes predictions, it detects changes or anomalies, and it takes actions. And because it's taking actions, you, most of the changes that occur on your sensory organs, most of the changes that are coming in on your data, your sensory streams, are because of your own behavior. So every time you move your eyes, which is three to five times a second, you have a complete new innovation coming on, uh, on your optic nerve. And um, when, you, when you feel things, it's your own body moving through space and, and touching things and so on. So a good portion, of, a vast majority of the changes on your data, uh, your sensors are coming from the, your own behavior as you move and manipulate the world. So what we say is that the cortex learns a sensory motor model of the world. And what we want to know is how does it do that? What does it look like? What does that model look like and how is it learned? And we know a lot about this now. Okay. Uh, let's start off with the basic high-level theory um, about what the cortex does, and this is called, we call it hierarchical temporal memory, or HTM. And the three terms are very descriptive. The first is that it's a hierarchy. So when you look at the neocortex, it's actually a sheet of cells. It's about two and a half millimeters thick. It's about a thousand square centimeters. So you can imagine this very thin sheet. It's like a large dinner napkin or serviette, what do you guys call it? Um, and, um, but that sheet is divided into regions, and those regions are connected together in a hierarchy. This is very well documented. And the amazing thing about this, this, the cortical sheet is no matter where you look, no matter what region, where you are in the hierarchy, and uh, what information it's receiving, they look nearly identical. In fact, these regions look so, they're, they're common across species and modalities. So, you know, the vision, uh, vision area in a human and a mouse look almost identical. And in the urine brain, higher levels and lower levels look almost identical. And it's been known for uh, over 30 years that everywhere in the neocortex is basically implementing the same learning algorithm. There's variations on a theme, but basically it's the same thing. So this is a, a wonderful discovery that if we understand how one area of the neocortex works, we're going to understand how most of the neocortex works. And there's nothing vision about the visual aspects. There's nothing auditory about the auditory aspects of the neocortex. The, the brain hears and sees using the same methods. Um, the second part of that is the regions, the, the memory in the cortex, and this really is a memory system, is mostly sequence memory. And you might be surprised by that, but I think sequence memory, you can think of like a memory of a melody or something like that. Most inference is relied on sequence memory. So imagine my voice right now. You're understanding what I'm saying. Um, the patterns in time matter. What, what pattern follows what in time is very, very important. And uh, if I mix up the order, it would be different. The same is true of touch. When you touch things, your hands move in a particular pattern over surfaces and so on. As you move through the world, these are sequences. Um, it, vision, most people are confused about vision. They think of vision as a spatial inference problem, like there's a picture in front of you. But that's not true. The, as I mentioned earlier, the, the input from the eyes is changing three to five times a second every time your eyes move as a cod and your head's moving and you move through the world and things in the world are moving. And so vision two is mostly an inference, uh, a temporal inference problem. And finally, motor behavior, which is high level motor behavior, which is generated by, by the cortex, is also a time-based pattern. So my speech, which right now is being generated by my neocortex, is a very complex pattern of muscle innovations that's going on, it's going to be for 45 minutes or so, and I'm playing back patterns that I've stored in the past, the words, the phrases, the ideas, these are all things I've learned, and I can play them back through a memory recall process. And the final part about 
a hierarchical temporal memory is that as you as information enters the hierarchy, so from the bottom in this case, um, and it goes up region to region in the hierarchy, you see stability, meaning the, the cells that are at the bottom level are changing fairly rapidly, and then as you go up to higher and higher levels, the cells are more stable. And what we, we think is going on there is that this, the sequences, if they are correctly predicted, if they're understood, then the brain makes a stable representation of it. It's like the name of the melody. And so what you pass up to the next region is names of little melodies, and the next region is learning you know, sequences of sequences, and sequences of sequences of sequences, and so on, and you go up the hierarchy. And then as you go back down the hierarchy, sequences are unfolded. So I can say, oh, give a brain talk about this, I've got a bunch of people in London, and I unfold this very complex pattern as I go back down the hierarchy. That's the overall theory about how the cortex works. Uh, it's a very simplistic view of it, but it's, uh, I think it's correct. Now we can, we can jump in a little bit further. We're going to dive into a little bit more, a little more theory. And um, so imagine here you have a sheet of the cortex. Um, and here's, you're looking at any area. It doesn't really matter what area. And it's about two and a half millimeters thick. And then if you jump in one level deeper, and I zoom in on one spot. Yeah, go back to the slide. Um, I go one level. Oops, sorry. Matt's in control here. I'm giving him crazy directions. Um, uh, if you, you jump down one more, you'll see that the cortex, no matter where you look, no matter what species of mammal, no matter where you look in the cortex, you're going to see layers of cells. And the, the, the number of layers is not that important, but basically there's four layers of cells. They're labeled two, three, four, five, and six. Um, and you see this everywhere. If you jump in one more level of detail, you zoom in a little bit further, you'll see the second organizing principle. Um, and this is uh, as deep as we're going to go for a while here. Uh, and that's that the cells are arranged in these little columns, these little mini columns, they're called them. So you've got, so all the cells are vertically, uh, these cells are packed in these very tiny vertical columns across the layers. And so there might be 100 cells in a mini column. So this is the basic organization. This is the structure how the brain works. All your memories are stored in this kind of a structure. And the question is, what's going on here? So we have a, we have a, a, a theory about this. Um, we believe that each layer in the neocortex is learning, is learning sequences of patterns. And they're doing it for different purposes under different conditions. But it's all about sequence memory. And so layer four and layer three are both inference layers. And layer five is the motor output layer. And layer six is the attention layer. We have studied this quite a bit, and we think we know in detail how at least layers two, three works. And it's very similar to the other layers. And we call this the cortical learning algorithm, or CLA. It's basically a model or a theory about how a layer of cells in the neocortex learns sequences of patterns and does prediction and inference with them. It's a, it's a basic learning algorithm. And uh, we've been testing this for quite some time. We have a, and this is uh, stuff we, we, we deal with every day. So we're pretty confident we understand to, to a fairly deep level what's exactly going on here. Um, now, it's important to understand the CLA is not just another neural network. Some people say, isn't this just an artificial neural network? Not really. No, it's a cortical model. It's got neurons in it, but the neurons are unlike anything you've ever seen before. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. They're like real neurons. They're not artificial at all uh, in terms of how they operate. And so you just have to, you have to understand a little bit more depth to, to architecture than you would in a typical artificial neural network that you might be familiar with. Uh, and I'm going to give you some flavor for that. And I'm going to go a little deep here for a while, and I'll come back out and make it easier again in a moment. So hopefully I won't lose everybody here. So let's just talk about uh, these layers a little bit more. I've already mentioned this briefly, but the way this works in the real brain, so, you know, by the way, if we understand what I'm showing you on the screen, you've got to understand a hell of a lot about how brains work. This is really getting at the core of what all intelligence is built upon. This is it. There's nothing else going on in the cortex. So in layer four is a basic input layer, and it gets your sensory data. The terms uh, neuroscientists use is called afferents, which this means feed forward data. And um, so it gets a copy of, you know, what's going on in your senses and, and somewhere else in the brain. But it also gets a copy of motor commands, meaning there are parts of your body that generate your behavior. The cortex just controls them, but it gets a copy of what's going on. So when your eyes move, the cortex gets a copy of the motor command that made your eyes move. So the cortex knows what behaviors you're, you're performing, and it also knows what you're sensing, sensory motor. And what we believe is going on is that layer four cells learns a sensory motor transitions. Uh, what do I mean by that? Again, think about like a saccade in the vision. So you, here's a face. And as you look at the face, your eyes will saccade over the different parts. You might look at the hair, then the eyes, and the nose, and the mouth. 
you don't realize your eyes are doing this. Your, your perception is stable. You look, you just see this face. But the reality is the input coming into your brain is changing dramatically, completely every few, you know, every few hundred milliseconds. Now, what layer four tries to do is predict what you're going to see next, or what you're going to hear next, or what you're going to, and it's going to do that based on your own behavior. So in this case, the, um, excuse me, go back a second. In this case, the order in which I look at a face is not fixed. Sometimes I'll go eye, eye, nose, mouth. Sometimes I'll go ear, he, hair, whatever. It's not a high order sequence. It's just, but if I knew what behavior you're going to do, and I knew what you're looking at now, I can predict what you're going to see next. And that's what's going on in layer four. Now what happens is, if layer four can make a correct prediction about what's going to occur next, it creates a stable pattern in the next layer of the cortex, which is two, three. This is the standard uh, neuroscience about how information flows in the cortex. And if it can't predict what's going to happen, it essentially says, I have no idea what's going on here, I can't model this, it passes the changes through. So this got back to that temporal stability I talked about earlier. The basic idea is that layer two, three are learning high order transitions. Um, a high order transition is like a melody. Uh, here's an example, here's some patterns. Two patterns, A, B, C, D, and X, B, C, Y. And if I showed you just A, B, C, if I trained the system on this, and I showed you A, B, C, it should predict D. And if I showed you X, B, C, it should predict Y. That's a high order um, um, sequence because I can't just use the previous state to know what to predict next. And this is the way the world is structured, by the way. So um, this is the problem that the brain has to solve in language and music and, and motion and hearing and you name it, everything, vision. These are the two major ways of doing inference. And you see these everywhere in the neocortex. Um, then in layer three projects in the next higher region and the, and the, and the process repeats. The, um, I'm going to argue that these two basic ideas of inference for sensory motor transitions and for high order transitions are it. There's nothing else. These, these apply to every modality. They apply to vision, hearing, touch. doesn't really matter. These are universal um, inference steps, and um, they apply to anything. So if you've got some sensory organs and you have some behavior, this would work for them. The other two layers... Um, uh, which are layer five, it's where the motor generation is created in the, in the brain. The cells there actually project to areas of the part, your body that generate behavior. And uh, layer six is attention. What I'm going to claim here is that we understand layers two, three very well. We've been building these for years. We tested them in our commercial product. We're, we started to understand layer four pretty well. And when I say 90% understood, I'm saying I am 90% of the, uh, know what I need to do to build this in software and test it. Uh, it's not like we understand 90% of all the biology. We're talking about actually building something practical with it. On the motor side, it's only about 50%. And on the attention side, it's even less, about 10%. I have another talk online you could listen to about motor uh, behavior if that's something of interest to you. But we're making progress on these, and these are all based on the CLA in, in one way or the other. Okay, so we're going to jump in a little bit further, and we're going to dive a little bit deeper um, into the CLA and how it works. And um, and then we'll then we'll take a breather and come back and talk about some easy stuff. Um, but you know this is the kind of in the, this state of the world right now. You kind of need to know this stuff if you're, if you're going to work on our open source project, for example. Okay, let's jump back in there. Uh, bring up that slide again, Matt. Thanks. He's trying to do it. <laughs> okay. Um, so I already said that the the cortical learning algorithm, the way we first implement it is is really sort of modeling high order uh, sequences, high order transitions. And so what's going on there? Before I can tell you exactly how it works, I want to give you a little, a few more things to talk, think about. I'm going to talk about sparse distributed representations, and I'm going to talk about neurons, what they look like. And then we'll put it all together and show you how this thing works. So let's just jump to sparse distributed representations. These are the language of the brain. It, uh, SDRs, as we call them, are how the neuroscience works, how the brains work, and it's not an option. This is not some like thing you can do. It's just there for the biology. It's part of the theory about how all information runs. So how do we understand it? The easiest way to understand it is first contrast it to what we do in computers. In computers, we do what are called dense representations. So a dense representation is like a, a byte or a word. So you might take 8, 32, 64 bits. It's dense because we use all combinations of ones and zeros. So we use all, all possible uh, representations. An example is the ASCII code. So there's the eight letter, eight bit character for the letter M. Notice in something like, in a representation like this, that the bits themselves don't mean anything. Um, the, if I ask you what the third bit in the ASCII code means, it has no meaning. Uh, in fact, if I change one bit, I have a completely different uh, representation. And so these are some sense in arbitrarily assigned uh, representations. 
And this is pretty much what we use in, the, in computers all the time. The, the computer itself, it, it, we have to assign meaning to it. The computer itself doesn't know what these things mean. In the brain, it's quite different. Um, in a brain, now when I talk about bits, you can think of them as ones and zeros. You can also think of them as cells. So if I say I have thousands of bits, I'm talking about thousands of neurons. Um, if I say most of them are zeros, I mean most of them are inactive. So what you typically see in an SDR, you need at least several thousand bits to, to do something. And most of them are ones, meaning most of the cells, I mean, excuse me, very few are ones, um, and mostly zeros. So in, in the brain, what we see always is very few cells are, are active and very, uh, I'm assuming very few cells are relatively active. Most of the cells are relatively inactive. We'll use this example of 2,000 bits SDR, and we'll say 2% of the bits are active. Now, we're always going to have 2% of the bits active. That's the state of, that's what an SDR is. It's always sparse. It always has a certain amount of percentage active. So I might have 41 bits and 1,960 zero bits. Now, the difference here is that the bits mean something. They have semantic meaning. You can actually say what each bit means, or you potentially could say what each bit means. This is learned in the brain. It's not assigned. Uh, but for the moment, we can just you know, assume it's stable. And so what might a bit be? Well, if I was going to craft a representation for letters, which I wouldn't do, but if I did, uh, I could say, well, one bit would mean um, this is a vowel, another one's a consonant, another one says it sounds like an E, I, or O, O sound, another one has a, a soft or fricative sound. I could have bits describe how the letter is written, is it closed or open, does it have ascenders or descenders. I can have bits to say where it is in the alphabet, what's next to it, and so on. And, and what I would do is if I wanted to represent a letter, I'd pick the top 40 attributes that match that letter. And, and if I picked another le letter, I'd pick the top 40 attributes that match that letter. And that's how the brain forms representations. Now, this has some really great properties. And so let's going to go through a few of them. Um, and this is the key. In fact, you know, I'll tell you now, if you want to remember only one thing from my talk about the future of intelligent machines, you should remember that they're going to be built on sparse distributed representations. That's the key. Okay, so first property. If I took two SDRs, two representations, and they have a common bit in common, I mean, they share the same bit being one, I can say they have semantic similarity. They're sharing some semantic meaning. This will not happen by chance. So if I see a, a couple of bits on like this, I say, oh, yeah, these guys are similar, and here's how they're similar, because that's, those bits represent something semantic. If I wanted to, um, let's say I wanted to remember a pattern and then say, hey, does this pattern occur again later? A store and compare operation, like store this pattern and let's see if it occurs again. We're not going to save all 2,000 bits. That's what we would do in a computer. What we're going to do is just save the locations of the one bits. So I have a list of 40 indices and I say, okay, I have 41 bits. Let's remember where they are. And now if I see a new pattern coming in, I just look in those locations and I'll say, well, if there's ones there, I have the same pattern. That's going to be guaranteed. By the way, in a brain, these connections are the synapses between cells. Um, now, what if I couldn't store the locations of all the one bits? I could only store the locations of a few of them, a, a subsample of them. Let's say I said you can only store 10 of them. I pick randomly 10 of them. Well, we can do the same operation, and a new pattern comes in. I'll look in those 10 locations, and I'll say, yeah, there's 10 ones there. I'll say it's the same pattern. But you might say, wait, that's, that could be an error. What about the other 30? They could be different. And that's true. However, two things. First of all, that's extremely unlikely uh, that that's going to happen. Uh, it just seems to happen by chance. So if you do the statistics, it's extremely unlikely. But also, even if you do make a mistake, you're making a mistake for something that's semantically similar to the thing you store. It's got a lot of semantic attributes in common, and therefore, it's a good substitute. And so this is the basis of generalization in the brain, is that we don't need to store the, you know, recognize the pattern completely, we can subsample, we can look at a partial pattern to say this is semantically close. And finally, we, there's, a, there's another property that we use a lot in our algorithms. And this is the most complicated one. Um, it's I can form a union of these things. I can or them together. So uh, in this case, I may take 10 of these guys, each of 2% of the bits active. If I or them together, literally just do that, I'll end up with a new representation, 2,000 bits, that has about 20% of the bits active. Now, I can't undo this. Uh, you can't ask, hey, what were the original 10? Not possible. But you can do something almost as good. You can say, here's a new one. Is it one of the original 10? And I'm going to claim that if you just look and say, well, is the union have bits in the same, one bits in the same location as the one I'm checking for, I'm going to say it's a fit. It's a good match. 
Now, again, you could point out that this could be an error because I could be matching some ones from one of the original 10, some ones from another original 10, and so on. Again, by the same logic, this is very unlikely to occur, extremely unlikely. I mean, almost astronomically unlikely, but it could. And, um, but if you do make a mistake or they don't all line up, it's still you're making a mistake for something semantically similar to the things you stored. So this is the kind of logic that the brain uses, and this is the kind of logic that intelligent machines use, and this is the kind of logic that we're using in our algorithms. Okay, now just a couple of words about neurons, and I promise, um, well, this is the last picture, I think, of a, of a biology thing. This is a picture of a real neuron in a brain. This is you, This 80% of the neurons in your brain, in your cortex, look like this. Uh, it's called a pyramidal cell. Now, um, these cells have lots and lots of synapses on them. These are the connections to other cells, and typically, um, there are 10,000 synapses on a neuron. However, only a few hundred of them are close to the cell body, and they, they are the class, they define what you might consider the classic receptive field of the cell. If, I, if a neuroscientist looks at the cells, well, why does the cell respond? They'll look at those hundreds and they'll say, yeah, that defines it. And all the other 9,800 don't seem to be doing too much. Um, those other, the vast majority of the synapses are on these distant um, connection, these distant dendrites, the so dendrites are these trees that come out from the, the, the neuron. And, and what we now know, which we didn't know 15, 20 years ago, is these, these dendrites are active computing elements. They do something interesting. And what they do is if you have, say, um, 10 to 15 to 20 connections on a dendrite, and these connections are close to each other, very close, right next to each other on the branch, and they become active at the same time, then we gener it generates what is called the dendritic spike and it has a large effect on the cell body. If those synapses became active at different times or in different locations, nothing occurs. And so what we can think about the neuron is it's got all these coincidence detectors all around it. It's looking for a whole bunch of unique patterns. And if it finds one of those patterns, it's going to do something interesting. And you can think of that as context. So these other thousands of synapses what they will do is they will recognize a pattern and they'll put the cell into a what's called a depolarized state or we call it a predicted state. So the cell can say, oh, look, I'm going to be able to predict my own activity if I see one of these many patterns out there. This is a picture of our artificial neuron that we use in our simulations and it captures this. The green dots are the, the proximal or the synapses that are, that are near the cell body and then the blue dots in this one are all those uh, ones on the far distance, and those are the ones that are like coincidence detectors. So that's what we're showing here. And so when we build these models, this is inherent in how our models work. Okay, now we're going to tell you how the basics, how you learn transitions. I'm not going to go through all of it. Imagine I have a bunch of cells in an array like this. So those little cubes, each one of those is one of those cells. And um, they're all receiving some input. And, and they get different amounts of input from the input space. So you imagine when you have input coming from your eyes, it's this big array of bits. It's not like one thing. And each cell is getting a different amount of input. We won't talk about that. And that's what the color represents. Some of these are getting more input than others. And what will happen is a cell that gets the most input will fire first and inhibit the guys nearby. And all the cells are trying to do this. And what will happen is when you have an input, You'll, by, you'll end up with a sparse representation. You'll end up with just a few of the cells being active and most of the cells being inactive. And there's a picture of a small section of one of our simulations um, just showing you a few cells and what a sparse representation might look like in a brain or in a simulation if you want to put a visualization on it. Now, this is a sparse cell activation or sparse uh, representation. Now, uh, this is like a one time you have this pattern, but at another time you'll have a different pattern. Let me go back, one, forward, back, one, forward. Okay, this is what we want to, this is what the brain has to learn sequences of. When it's learning sequences, it's learning sequences of these sparse patterns. And the way it does that is pretty cool. Um, an individual cell, when it becomes active, um, looks for other cells nearby that were just active a moment before, and it forms connections to them on one of its dendrites. And so it'll say it'll be able to say, hey, I've seen this pattern before, and when I see it again, I'm going to predict I'm going to become active next. And every cell is doing this, not, not, because they all become active some percentage of the time, and everybody's learning to recognize lots and lots of patterns. So when you provide a new pattern to the system, what will happen is some of the cells become active, those are the red cells in this picture, and some of them will be predicted, those are the yellow cells in this picture, they're, they're polarized. Now there's more yellows than reds in this case because this typically what will happen is I might learn many transitions. So if I learned A followed by B and A followed by C and A followed by D and I show it A, it's going to predict B, C, and D, the union of those patterns at the same time. 
So that's what's typically going on. Now there's a problem with this. This is a not a high order memory. This is a um, uh, it only can learn one state transition. So this is a first order sequence memory. It cannot distinguish between A B C D and X B C Y. It doesn't have the ability to do that. And the way that the that the brain solves this, and the way our algorithm solves this, and CLA solves this, is going back to those mini columns I mentioned earlier. And I have one slide on that, which is a, a little bit of a build here. So we want to understand how could our cells learn high order sequences, and how we're going to use mini comps for that. So we're trying to solve the ABCD prediction versus the XBCY prediction. So let's talk about before training. Here are some pictures I made that sort of give you a sense of what's going on. Each of these little boxes is representing a very, very teeny little sort of caricature of a slice of a cortical layer or layer cells. The dots are in mini columns. You can see there's like uh, six cells in each column. And there's a, maybe a dozen columns in each of these little pictures. And it's sparse. So, in any, so the letter A, the input A is represented by three columns. The letter B is represented by three columns. C is another three columns. And D is another three columns. These are sparse representations of the, the patterns A, B, C, D. Of course, we were doing this in much larger number of cells. But this is to illustrate. Now, if I showed you the next pattern, X, B, C, Y, well, you see X is different than A. But the B is the same as the B, and the C is the same as the C, and the Y is different than the D. So this isn't going to work. What happens after training is really interesting. We start off with the same A. But when you go to the next pattern, this is after training the sequence, you end up with um, a new pattern B, B prime. And what B prime has, it's got the same columns active. You can see that there, the same three columns. But now we're only activating an individual cell in each column. It's much sparser. Instead of having 18 cells active, I got three in this picture. And the same thing would happen with C prime, and, the, and so and the same thing would happen with D prime. So if I, after training, I learned a sequence, I'd go A to B prime to C prime to D prime. The columns are the same as before, but now we have different cellular representations. If I did the same thing for the X, B, C, Y sequence, I'm now labeling it B double prime and C double prime, you'll see that B prime, B double prime, and B all have the same columns, but they have different cells. And this allows the system to represent C or B in many, many different contexts. It allows us to say this is a C, yet it's uniquely in this sequence. And it allows us to predict D instead of Y. Um, this is a key to how the whole thing works. Um, and just to give you a flavor for this, if we had 40 active columns, not just three, and there were 10 cells per column, these are very small numbers from a brain's point of view. There would be 10 to the 40th ways to represent the same input pattern in different contexts. That is, I could learn 10 to the 40th different ways of B, representing B in different sequences. And that's a very, very large number, of course. And so the brain has this ability to learn almost, a, almost a, an unlimited number of, of uh, contextual ways of representing the same thing in different contexts. All right, this is all about the CLA. And I know it's a lot to observe. Um, and you can't absorb this in, uh, in one session. Uh, and I hope I didn't you know, lose you too much on that. Uh, but I wanted to give you a flavor for it. In the end, you'll have to take my word for it. The thing really works, and it works well. It converts an input into a sparse distributed representation in columns. It learns transitions, these high order transitions. And it's able to make predictions and detect anomalies. Um, we use it in the brain, and we can use it in machine intelligence for inference, high order inference, sensory motor inference, and motor recall. That's how, the, how, how your, your brain does it. And it has some really nice capabilities. It's an online learning system, meaning it, it, you don't batch up the data. It just learns as you go. You throw in new data. I didn't tell you how this happened, uh, but you can read about it. Uh, it's very high capacity. Even a very small region of, of the CLA can, it can learn millions of transitions. It works on simple learning rules. It's naturally fault tolerant. So no cell, no neuron, no synapse, no column is essential. And uh, there are no sensitive parameters. It's like this thing has to be really tweaked to get it to work. Uh, there are parameters. You can make it work differently in different ways, but it's nothing really sensitive. So these are great attributes, and these are the kind of things we'd like to see in a system uh, like machine intelligence. OK, I argue that this is a basic building block in machine intelligence. It's a basic building block in the neocortex. And there are people out there now trying to figure out how to build this stuff in hardware. OK, um, so let me, um, I want to make sure you still know I'm here. <laughs> um, let me just talk briefly about, now I'm going to switch to applications. Like, does this stuff really work? What do you do with it? And what can you do? So in this case, uh, I'm going to talk about how we've used it at our company in, uh, for anomaly detection. And, um, and then I'll talk about another application in natural language processing. 
So we were trying to find a commercial application for, for the CLA. And um, so we said, let's do it for anomaly detection and streaming metric data. So we can take a, a server, and uh, we can take the, a, a data point off that server every minute, every five minutes. We combine it with time. We run it through an encoder, which turns it into a sparse distributed representation. We then feed that to the CLA. The CLA builds a model of how this metric or this value changes over time. And from that, we get a prediction. We can detect if there's a prediction error. And we do some interesting um, so statistical processing on the other side, which we, you can read about on a white paper on our website. What you end up with is an anomaly score. You can end up saying, the state of this system, how unlikely is it, given what I've seen in the recent past, given what I've learned about how this thing changes over time over the last, let's say, three weeks or a month, um, how unlikely is it these patterns that I'm seeing now? These are temporal patterns. It's like listening to someone play music and saying, hey, have they gotten better or worse? Are they making more mistakes? Have they changed their style? Something like that. We can do this for lots of metrics and off the same machine, and we can put this in a product, and we did. So I'm going to tell you a bit about our product. I'm not trying to sell you on our product. I'm just trying to illustrate how it works. Um, the product's called Grok. We've initially, it's about a month old. We've been on the market for like a month. Um, and it's designed for the Amazon um, marketplace, the Amazon AWS. This is their cloud services um, that much of the internet runs on. And uh, so we run this on top of AWS. And the, the point of this is that we get data from uh, AWS through a thing called CloudWatch. We get data from the servers themselves. We feed this into Grok. Grok builds models of this data. And it does this in an automated way because the whole thing's learning online continuously. And then it sends the results to a little mobile client. And um, this is not brain related, but uh, just to give you a sense of how this whole thing works. And what we do is we show you for all the different instances, all the different servers you're monitoring, we show you how anomalous they have been in the last week or the last day or the last hour. And so very, and it's sorted. So very quickly you can look at something and say, hey, is everything, everything working well? What's, what's unusual? Uh, and then you can drill down to see what's going on. Uh, I need to tell you a little bit about the interface for this just so you know um, what I'm going to show you some other pictures which are interesting. Uh, so again, we start off with this uh, on the left there, sort of a sorted list of how anomalous your servers are. The, on any particular server, you can drill down and see which metrics are involved and how anomalous they are. This is all done. Those on the gray area in the middle picture, those three different models, they are all a cortical model. Every one of these things is running. We're running hundreds of cortical slices on this data. And then the final picture, someone can actually look in and see what the actual metric data is and see why the Grok determined it was uh, unusual or not. So we sort this by anomaly score, and it's continually learning, and it's continuously updating. Now here comes some of the interesting things. So I want to give you a sense for the kind of sensitivity to the CLA. What did the CLA bring to this? Why, why did we use the CLA for this? Here's a, just give you some examples. Here's a very a sudden and obvious change in the data. The blue line, again, represents data coming off a server. In this case, it's CPU utilization, now how much of the CPU is being used. And you can see Grok detected when it was running along at one level, and then it just suddenly jumped to another level. That's pretty obvious. Um, here's a little, a little bit less obvious, a slow change. So things are sort of creeping up slowly over a matter of days, and eventually Grok says, that's enough. That's change. Here's something which is a very subtle change. The two pictures on the right, uh, again, we're, we're talking about how the cortical model is modeling this data. We're sending this data into the cortical model, and it's trying to make predictions about it. In this case, the, the data is very predictable. It's a very regular pattern. Grok in, did not detect those two spikes in the third picture to the right. Um, because it's seen them before. But if we zoom in on the, the big block of blue there, we go from looking at a week's worth of data to looking at a day's worth of data, you'll see that Grok detected a very subtle change in a very repeated pattern. So normally, every hour, there's a little tick up in um, behavior here. And one day, one hour, it sort of changed right, a slightly amount. So this is a very regular data set. Grok built a very, a very highly predictive model, and it could detect when something was very subtly different. Okay. Here's a case where we can predict changes in a noisy data stream. So in this case, the CLA is not able to make very accurate predictions because it's spiking all over the place. But it still can build a predictive model. And it can tell when that model has gotten worse or when things become less predictable. And finally, I'm going to show you this last example, um, which is I, I think really shows the power of this kind of tool. And I don't know of any other way of doing this. These, these three pictures represent the same server at a, a particular time. And the two left pictures of the three are two metrics, one CPU utilization, one disk write bytes. And, the, and again, here you see Grok detected an anomaly in the data. 
And if you look at the blue line, the data, it's not obvious why Grok detected that, that area. What was about it? Why was that less predictable at that point in time? And it's not clear. Um, it, a human wouldn't have been able to pick that out. But Grok, in a CLA, said there's something unusual about this. I know the patterns of this data. This is less, I couldn't predict this. It's less predictable than it was before. And it turns out in this particular case, these two models uh, both detected a very sudden, a subtle change. One of our engineers went on to a server that normally is an automated build server, if you know what that means. It basically, it builds our product over and over again on an automated basis. And he started a manual build process. And so it detected when a human did something slightly different because a human was doing what is normally done automatically. And um, so this shows the power of, the, of, of in, in, this, in our case, we're using the CLA in this uh, cortical models for basically doing very sophisticated anomaly detection and streaming of data. That's not, you might not think of that as a, a machine intelligence application, but that's the kind of thing we can do today, and it's very powerful and it's very valuable. Okay, let's switch now uh, and talk about a, a different application. Um, this is uh, from a company called SEPT in, uh, in Austria. And what they did is um, this guy named Francisco Weber, he read our papers about the CLA and, and sparse distributed representations. And he said, hey, this, is, this, is, this solves a problem. He was, he was a natural language expert. And he said, this is, I've been working on these problems of representation in natural languages. And he says, my gosh, these sparse distributed representations are the key to solving natural language problems. So he did something very clever. Um, let's take a look at that. He, first of all, he built a tool that built sparse, sparse distributed representations from um, of words and, and proper nouns and so on. Um, he started with 100,000, now I think he's up in the millions, I don't, I don't remember. But he did this automatically, he takes Wikipedia and he feeds it through a, a, a little parser he's created and ends up producing these sparse distributed representations, one for each word. Now, why do I call them sparse distributed representations? Well, there's, in this case there are 16,000 bits. They're sparse, meaning only a few of the bits are one and most of them are zeros. But he has the properties we talked about earlier where bits have semantic meaning. He doesn't assign them, they're learned. But if two representations share bits, they're sharing some sort of semantic learning. And you can try to tease out what that semantic meaning is, but it's not so easy, just like it is in the brain. But they are true sparse distributed representations. So now he did some very clever things with them. You can do something like the following. You can take the, the, the SDR for the word apple and the sparse distributed representation for the word fruit. And now they're going to share some bits, and they're going to have some bits that are different. So in some cases, there's some bits that, that are some semantic meaning that are common between those two. If you take subtract out the bits that are in apple that are in fruit, meaning remove the fruitness from apple, you'll get another sparse distributed representation. It's a subset of what the apple representation was. And you can look that up. That's a new representation we've never seen before. It's a novel one, but it's going to be close and overlap with other ones. And so we can say, which does it overlap most with? And the answer you get is computer. So if you take apple minus fruit, you get the best match you get is computer. The next best matches are shown here, Macintosh, Microsoft, Mac, Linux, and so on. This is a semantic processing done with SDRs. That's very, very cool, and there's a lot of stuff you can do with this. At our last hackathon in uh, the fall, our VP of engineering, Subhatai Ahmad, did, took this and used it with the CLA. So here's what he did. He said, uh, okay, let's train the CLA on sequences of words, like sentences. Very simple. We did three word sentences. And the words, the sentences he picked had this structure to them. They began with an animal. The second word was either eats or likes. And the last word, what the animal eats or likes. So an elephant eats leaves and, a, and an elephant likes water. He made up just a, you know, 50 or 70 sentences like this. He fed it into the CLA. That he trained it on these sequences. And then he said, okay, let's ask the CLA a question. He fed in the pattern for fox and eats. Now, the CLA had never been trained on the word fox. Never. He'd been trained on other animals, but not the word fox. This is the first time it saw the word fox. But fox, obviously, is going to have semantic similarity to other animals in the list. And so we could ask, okay, what does the CLA predict the fox eats? Given it knows what an elephant eats and what a cat eats and what a wolf eats and what a you know, frog eats, what would a fox eat? And you get a prediction from the CLA, and you can look up that prediction and say what it's closest to, and the answer he got was rodent, which is really cool. This is, I'm not, I don't want to oversell this. This is, you know, we're not, we haven't built the natural language machine that's very capable yet, but we're doing it the way the brain does it, and exactly the way the brain does it. You're using the same type of representations, we're using the same type of memory systems, we're using the same type of predictions. 
And um, I think this was a real, really, really beautiful demonstration of both the SDRs and the CLA, and, and there's a lot of applications for this. So just review here, this whole thing was done without supervision. Um, it exhibits semantic generalization both at the word level and at the grammatical level. And uh, I, we think there's going to be a lot of interesting applications, uh, commercial applications for this. Now, let me remind you, well, I'll just tell you, that in these two cases where Grok, I talked about are using it for streaming analytics, and SEP using it for natural language processing, that's the exact same CLA code base. In fact, it's the exact same code. We didn't, we didn't modify the code to get it to work in these two different examples. In fact, the code wasn't written to do either one of these. The code was written to emulate the generic or the universal process of how brains learn high order sequences. And, um, and we're able to apply it to different problems um, uh, with really very little effort. Uh, well, it sound, I can make it sound like it's a little effort. Um, OK, so now I'm going to switch to, uh, to getting close to the end. Here we uh, our NUPIC open source project. Um, and I just want to tell you a few minutes. The guy on our end who you can't see, <laughs> um, bring me back up here. Sure. Matt, uh, and Matt Taylor. He's our he's our uh, the guy who runs our new big open source project, and um, we started this last summer, um, and uh, it's uh, it's been going very well. In there, we have the source code for the cortical learning algorithm for the encoders and a bunch of support libraries. You should know that this the this is a single source tree, meaning our code that we use in Grok is in this repository. So when we make a new update to the Grok algorithms, you'll, you they're there right away. Um, we have an active and growing community, uh, which is great. We've run two hackathons. We're going to do a third one. Um, uh, when is the third one, Matt? May 3rd and 4th. May 3rd and 4th. And that's going to be here in San Jose, uh, California. And if we have enough interest, then we can somehow manage to do it. Well, maybe we'll do one with, uh, with the person tall guys in, in, in the UK, we'll say, or in Britain. Um, and you can find that at nementa.org. Um, I don't know, Matt, if you want to add a few more comments about NewPick at this time. or. Um, yeah, I, I think maybe I'll say something. Hopefully they can uh, they can hear me. Um, you want to come around here and just? No, let me just show them a. Oh, okay. Let me just show them a, a website here. Uh, share. Not this one. There we go. Uh, so, hopefully you can hear me. But this is nementa.org, and um, they, we've got a, a community of 92 contributors now, and it's. It's growing very quickly. We've got over 700 people on our mailing lists. Um, so if you're interested in, in the theory that Jeff is talking about, we have a mailing list for theory. We've got a discussion list if you want to try and get new pick working for yourself. And then you know a list for us that are trying to develop new pick. Um, We've, we've also got a wiki with a nice path if you want to learn more about how to use NewPick, how to get things started. Um, more stuff about the theory. Uh, there's a Jeff mentioned a video about sensory motor integration, so there's a link there. So please feel free to go to uh, dementia.org, and there's a, a link to our wiki from there. So yeah, that's about all I want to say. I hope you could all hear that. Matt's doing a great job of running the, uh, the NewPick project. Um, uh, just so I go to the next slide here, which is our goals for uh, 2014. Um, and uh, we have some research goals. We want to finish implementing the, the layer four sensory motor inference. Uh, we might, if we can, get back to introducing hierarchy. Uh, I have a goal to publish uh, some in, in uh, peer-reviewed papers. We haven't done enough of that, so we have to do that. New pick, we're going to grow the community. We, uh, we have some partners, some commercial partners like SEPT I mentioned. We're also working with IBM and some others, and so we have to support them. Uh, and so a lot of a lot of cool stuff going on in NewPick. Um, a lot of projects. We talked to Matt about that. And then we're trying to create some, uh, you know, show this commercial value for the CLA with our our Grok product, and that will help uh, attract other developers, help help attract commercial you know, dollars, and so on. And we're also looking at new application areas. There's a lot going on here. You know, I, I you know, I, this is really like the beginning of. Um, I feel like a little bit like we're in the 1940s. If you don't know the um, uh, oh uh, well well I'll come back in a second here. Um, it's like the 1940s. Why do I say it's like the 1940s? Because in uh, you know we entered the 1940s. People had the theory about computers. Uh, Turing had uh, written his uh, seminal papers in 1935, but really hadn't built any commercial computers yet. And when we left the 1940s and we entered 1950, we were actually the, the computing industry was going. 
Uh, I feel that's a lot like where we are right now, where we are getting these theories, we're understanding how, how the brain works, we're starting to build machines that work on them, and we're starting to just show commercial value. And, and you know, but it's hard. I, I, won't be, you know, I won't beat around the bush about this. There's a lot of new concepts here, um, a lot of challenging things to understand. It'll take, it'll take you a while to really deeply understand how the CLA works. You can get there, trust me. Uh, it's beautiful when you get the whole thing. It's not that hard. But you know, it's not like uh, you know, it's, it's not so simple. We're we're on the forefront of of what's going to be many decades of um, advances in machine intelligence, and this is really the formative years. Um, uh, so just a summary of my talk here, what I covered so far. Um, I argued that the cortex, the neocortex, is as close to a universal learning machine as we can imagine, um, and therefore uh, machine intelligence will be built on the principles of the neocortex. And, um, and not some other principles. We need to understand these principles. And, and you can't, again, it's not to build human-like machines or machines that are going to be your buddy you're going to talk to. We build machines that learn on these principles that can do sensory motor models of the world and so on. Next is we've, we have an overall theory, or an overarching theory about how it's going on, H HTM, the hierarchical temporal memory theory. We know in detail one particular building block. That's the cortical learning algorithm. Uh, we've been exploring that and, and testing it extensively for years, and um, and we've shown some near-term applications in anomaly protection. I didn't talk about prediction and natural language processing. Um, it's very hard to know where this is going to go in the long term, but that's what we're doing right now. And I've invited you to participate. You can go to thementor.org, and there's a bunch of papers and lots more talks by me and other people if you care to listen to it. So I think I'm going to end there, um, and then we're going to do our Q and A. Thank you. I can't hear anything yet, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, so I think Ali, you've got the mic. You're going to pass it around, and hopefully, I'll be able to hear what's going on. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, we, I think, everybody was. Uh, very concentrated. I think everybody uh, really enjoyed that. Um, so, you know, we'll take questions now. Um, so, anybody, just raise your hand um, if you have a question. Uh, hello, my name is Jack Kelly. Um, I'm a computer science PhD student at Imperial. Um, but before that, I did an undergraduate in neuroscience. So I'm, you know, what you're talking about here is is extremely exciting, and you know, a lot of machine learning is quite dry, and this is really sexy. It's cool. So <laughs> thank you very much. I I just wanted to ask, um, th can the CLA do classification, like in terms of you know a lot of kind of conventional machine learning? You showed an image, and it says that's a cat. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, is that the is, okay? I, I can't tell if you're done, so all right. Yeah, yeah, it can, go ahead. Uh, yes, it can do classification, and uh, there's lots of types of classification. Um, let me t let me try to answer two questions. Let me talk about classification in a general sense, and then just talk about like recognizing an image of a cat. Okay. Um, uh, essentially, at, at any point in time, the CLA, the state of the CLA, which cells are active and which cells are in a predictive state, but really, which cells are active is the sum total of all knowledge that the CLA has about the world in the, pa uh, in the past and the current context of the, the, the present. So it's an all knowledge applied to the current input stream. And so that sparse pattern you have coming out, that the activation pattern, which cells are active, is, uh, is a fairly unique state at any point in time. And, and you can classify it. Now, in the brain, that's classified by just feeding it auto-associatively to a bunch of other cells. But you can literally just stick it in a classic classifier. We've done this extensively. You can take any kind, of, any favorite classifier you have, uh, nearest neighbor or you know whatever you want, and and we've done a bunch of these, and you can classify that state, and um, and, and it works really well. Um, now that's assuming you've had the right input and you've trained the system properly. Um, and so the general the general answer is yes, you can do classification. We've also done clustering with it. Um, I don't know if we described that anywhere, but we could talk to you about that if you wanted to. Um, the, now the question is like, oh, well, can I recognize an image of a cat? Well, we haven't done anything with vision uh, yet. In fact, when we first created the CLA, we started working on vision problems. And we abandoned it for two reasons. 
Uh, one is that it, in the brain, um, a huge amount of your neocortex is, is assigned to vision. It's, it's something like 40% of the neocortex is only vision, and about 60% is primarily vision. It turned out that if you understand what's going on, um, it takes a lot, a lot of memory to get human level visual performance. Um, and we were finding, even in very simple problems, that our simulations were slow. Um, and uh, so, so the long story was we just we, we were going to run up. We wouldn't be able to do these simulations the way the brain does it. And we also had some mistakes back then. This is like four or five years ago. Um, we think we could do a better job now, but we haven't we haven't tackled that again yet. We're still kind of fearful of the of the you know the uh, the amount of memory and, and the, the resources would be required. Uh, we would go about it in a very very different way than other people would. Now you know you're probably aware of some of the advances that have been made recently in deep learning. Deep learning is just a hierarchical artificial neural network, and so they've got some of the same principles that we talk about in HTM, and I think these two fields will move together. But, but um, deep learning, I'll just jump right into that. The way they saw that they use no time whatsoever. There's no time element to it, but that's not how humans learn. We learn through time. And so we know how to do that, we think, but we're not really ready to, we're, computationally, we don't have the hardware to be able to do those simulations. They're just too complex. They just take too long to run. Um, so we've chosen to work on other problems which we can do today in software and do well. I'll make an observation just for the, you might be surprised by this. But I mentioned that the, in the human neocortex, about 60% of the, if it's, dead, it's working primarily on visual problems, 40% almost exclusively. Um, the areas associated with language are teeny compared to that. They're very small. And the, the, the evidence suggests uh, that language takes is a much easier problem than vision. Um, it takes certainly a lot less resources. Now, we could debate the, the intricacies of this, but you know, once you get, you know, I, I think we could do a lot more interesting stuff in language processing than we can do in vision, given the software constraints we have today. So I think we know how to do like recognize a cat. Um, uh, we're not we're doing it the way the brain would do it, a little bit less than the way like the deep learning guys are doing it. But uh, we're not really there yet from a simulation point of view. But we can do classification on lots of other problems. And that works really well. I can't see your eyes. I have no idea if I answered your question. Um, hello there. I'm, I'm, I'm John Drummond. I work for a spread betting company in research. I was just wondering, I, um, some of you already answered, was, again, having seen all the success Hinton and others have had with deep learning, whether you, you could expand a bit more on sort of similarities and differences in uh, the way you're working. Yeah, with, yeah. Uh, I, uh, first of all, I'm, 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 I'm friends of a lot of the people in the deep learning world. Um, I don't view, this is not an adversarial thing. This is a, we're all just trying to achieve the same results. Um, my approach, our approach is starting from the biology, starting from the neuroscience. Uh, most of the deep learning people are not taking that approach. Um, they're starting from more mathematical premises. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we both believe in hierarchy. It's all about hierarchy. And, um, we're not there yet because you know we're, we've decided to model the individual layers and understand how the processes are going where they went right for the hierarchy. But most deep learning people will admit um, that what the big thing they're missing is time. That they have no concept of time in, in, in most deep learning models. Uh, they can't possibly model, understand what a saccade does or how things move through time. And there's some talk about that. There's some, some primitive attempts, but really nothing inherently um, going on in time space. So they know that they have to move in the time direction. I know that we have to move more into the hierarchy direction. I also know we have to introduce motor behavior, which they have no concept about, and we're working on that. So I see these two fields as they should be merging together. They're not, they're not really contrary approaches. They're, they, they were, act, we're working on different aspects of the same problem. They're focusing more on non-time hierarchy. I'm focusing more on time and motor behavior. Um, we're knowing we have, to, we have to reintroduce the hierarchy. So um, we'll see how it plays out. I think it's all good as long as we don't get stuck in some, some local minimum, uh, which happened in the past with AI and with, uh, with early artificial neural networks. Uh, we, have to keep, we have to reintroduce time into these hierarchical models. We have to introduce behavior into these hierarchical models. And we have to introduce attention. And, and, and when we do that, uh, then we'll really be, we'll achieve something. Uh, hello there. My name is Antonio. Uh, it's the second time I have the honor to speak with you. The first one was like three years ago, and we had a meeting right there in your office. Oh. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, so even back then, I was convinced that you were on the right direction towards, you know, biological intelligence. Um, so I asked you how could I be helpful, and you said that I should become a programmer because you were trying to to build the product then, the the Grok product. So I thought that this wasn't really exciting, so I tried to explore more of the theoretical foundation of your work. Um, I would like like to summarize like with your theory in like 10 words and I would put it this way like uh, we live in space time so we use time to understand space and I think that this is like the core of the universality we are looking for in terms of the learning system that the neocortex is. Um, I th so that's not a question. Um, uh, <laughs> all right. Did you have a question, or can I just comment on your observation? Um, so, I mean, we can describe everything we can learn, and we can divide everything we can learn into a spatial and a temporal component. So, even whatever we can say, do, or learn is just this core, this spatial temporal core. And I think this is what gives the neocortex its universality. I, I think you're right, and um, I agree with that. And um, it, it, it's still mind-boggling to me when I think about how the cortex really doesn't know about sight, and it doesn't know about hearing, and it doesn't know about touch. That's not true for other parts of the brain, but that's true for, that is true for the cortex. And the way the cortex handles vision is exactly the same way it handles hearing and touch. It's, it's the same thing. And so knowing that you have to get to those universal principles is at first daunting, but it's also very enlightening when you start figuring out what they are. And, um, and I didn't talk about spatial patterns much here, but if you actually get into the, you read the white paper on the CNA, we talk about the spatial puller and the, the temporal puller and time sequence memory and so on. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, we're, we're looking for these universal properties. What, uh, space and time, what I've been arguing, and I still believe is true, is that time has been the, one, the most largely ignored component of AI and artificial neural networks. And that this is the thing, and, and the reason people ignored it because they focus on spatial vision problems. They said, well, look, we can recognize a pattern, a picture flashing in front of your eyes. There's no time involved. So let's just take time out of the picture. And that was a big mistake because time turns out to be the most important part of the whole memory. I, I, I argue about 90% of the memory in the cortex is time-based transition memory, and about 10% would be a spatial memory. And so time is a critical component, but pairing the two together is really the power of the whole system. And they are universal. Um, I, didn't, um, I didn't talk about speculating about the future here, but there's a gazillion types of problems that we don't even think about today that could be, that we could be dealt with uh, using these universal principles. Uh, one last sentence. Um, however powerful this uh, like universality might sound, I think it, it still has like a fundamental limitation. And I, th I guess it is a bit far-fetched, but uh, the theory you describe, and our neocortex as well, um, relies on the separation of space and time. And if we think about like the theory of relativity, space and time are ultimately connected in, in a sort of a way. So perhaps one day we will discover an even like more general theory of intelligence. Maybe, but I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to meet and you know do what a human can do. <laughs> I agree with you. I agree with you. <laughs> let's okay. let's start, let's start with the mouse. You know, I, I didn't tell you this, but the uh, the the CLA as we implement it today, which is 2,048 columns and uh, 64,000 neurons. That's every model we build is, is pretty much that these days. Um, that's about the thousandth the size of a mouse cortex. It's about the millionth the size of a human cortex. And uh, one one thousandth the size of a mouse cortex doesn't sound very big, but it's actually really powerful, that little slice. So we've got a long, all I'm pointing out is, is we can do a lot with a little, and we have a long way to go before we start bumping into Einstein. In the <laughs> good, so. I'll be I here. definitely agree with you. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, I'm talking to you again, Antonio. Hi, um, I'm Greg. I'm just a programmer with an interest in neural networks. I just kind of... Um, wanted to know um, how the system compares to um, the common sort of pitfalls of, of sort of general uh, machine learning things such as um, overfitting, such as local minima. Does, and um, I, one of my questions is also 
um, is does the CLA rely on the vast space um, to avoid overfitting such that you can, it can continually train itself but because of the amount of space that, that it's, it's using to represent the sparsity of the, of the space, is, it, is, it, is that how it avoids overfitting or is there some under, other fundamental yeah. way that it can... Well, that's, there's, a, there's a lot of concepts in that, in that question. It's a great question. Um, so let's try to tease it apart a little bit. Let me just tell you a little bit more about how the CLA learns. Um, so it, first of all, it has very large capacity. So you know, we can learn on millions of transitions um, in a, even a small section of it. But how does it fail? And, 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 and what happens when you continually overtrain it? Well, it, 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 the way we've implemented it, it has what we call fixed resources. So we're not, we don't increase the size of the, the number of synapses or the number of cells or the number of columns. And so it's a, like a brain. It's pretty relatively fixed. And when you train it more and more and more, two things can happen. You can set it up so that it forgets, which it does anyway, but you can make the, you can make the ratio of learning forgetting, you can change that. That's one of the parameters of the system. So how much do I want to bias toward previous learning? How much do I want to bias toward new, new learning? And it will forget older things. So one of the ways it fails is it can forget patterns it's seen in the past. If it's seen enough stuff since then, it will say, ah, I don't remember this. Um, if you don't have it forget, what it'll start doing is it'll start generalizing. It'll start seeing patterns like, like, like two melodies or two sequences, and it'll start saying, well, I'm going to treat them as the same. They're similar enough that I, I can't distinguish them between them anymore. Um, and so you, you do, you know, there's no magic system in machine learning. There's no perfect system that fits all problems. But the CLA has its own set of limitations, and this, these are the kind of ones we run into. You run into, like, choosing how much you bias toward the past with the future, how much you want to generalize, um, or you remember things uniquely. Um, and, but generally, the failures you see in the CLA are almost always failures of generalization. They never fail, it never fails cat catastrophically. It never like, up oh, too much, and now I start getting garbage results. But what you start doing is you start overgeneralizing. It starts predicting things um, in, more, in a more generic way. Um, and so less, you know, you, you be able to not detect very, very subtle changes in it. So it, I, I don't know if I, it, your question was kind of open-ended. There's a lot to it. I just want to say, like, it's not magic. Um, I'm not claiming it is. Um, and, but it's, it's got a lot of nice properties to it. And, and you have some control over them. We generally do not, when we're using it in our product or in our, in our tests and so on, we generally don't. Uh, we're not dealing a lot with those issues of overfitting and things like that. We mostly we look and find bugs, and we're we're having more problems getting the right data and um, figuring out some other parameters and things like that. Um, but uh, because the system sort of fails nicely, and therefore it, 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 even the evidence of failure is sometimes hard to find because it fails nicely. <laughs> so I hope I answer that a little bit. It, it's a it's a very deep topic, and we have to sort of get into lots of details to talk about specific type of problems. Uh, hi, Jeff. Uh, Peter Morgan here. Um, I, I have a little bit of a left field question, more of a business related one. When I mean, you've been going a while, you know, I love your product. I'd like to see it accelerated to market. Have, you know, you mentioned you're working with IBM. Has anyone approached you, like Google or Facebook, to kind of work with you on this problem? Um, well, I've had lots of conversations with companies. <laughs> I can't talk about all of them. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, look, look, there's a lot of big companies interested in machine intelligence. And, um, and there are different opinions about how to go about it. We represent one end of the spectrum of, of approaches. Uh, I tend to think it's going to be the one that, that uh, carries the, the weight in the end of the day, but we'll have to see. Um, so, you know, have we had lots of discussions with people? Yeah, I, there's, a, there's a talk online. I gave a Google Tech Talk last year. Um, I talked to all the senior people at Google uh, about these approaches, and we talked talk about the relative merits and so on. Um, so there's a lot of noise and a lot of interest in different fields. I mentioned IBM because we could talk about them, um, but I can't mention other people uh, that we're talking to. But um, there are lots of, lots of interest in this. Uh, there's a program being put together at DARPA, which is the United States Defense Advanced uh, Research Projects Administration. It's built uh, largely on our work. Um, these are people interested in building harder implementations of these algorithms. 
So there's a lot going on. Uh, it's but it's a very noisy field right at the moment, and you'll you know you'll see a lot of companies claiming different things and making lots of different investments. Google bought some uh, British company just last year, um, and and Qualcomm bought another one. You know who knows? Uh, we're kind of um, our approach is to keep our heads down, do the right thing. Um, you know, have a very long-term view of what we're doing, um, and I'm I'm fairly confident that uh, we'll have a positive effect on the field uh, over time, um, and um, and companies that are interested in this will will figure that out. Hi, Jeff. Uh, it's Peter Newman here. I'm uh, part of Artificial Learning, a company trying to build electronics uh, specifically for machine learning. Actually, working on the other side of the coin on, on uh, techniques like restricted Boltzmann machines, mm -hmm. and it works at the moment. but two questions for you um, after your great talk. First is: is is the CLA a, a deterministic uh, algorithm, or is it a stochastic algorithm? That will have impact on whether you can transfer learning from one system to another. And the other no. is: how do you see hardware uh, helping on the efficiency? Yeah. All right. Great questions. Um, so uh, yes, in theory, it's deterministic, um, and if we and we test, we, we use that in our some of our tests. So if there are a bunch of uh, random initializations to it, and if you start with the same random seeds, then you, and you under a controlled environment, you'll get the exact same answers. Um, and from a practical point of view, it's not always deterministic. <laughs> Because if I actually run it on a practical machine someplace, timing delays can change things, and and results end up it gets things things are slightly different. But if you take I can transfer the knowledge from one model to another, no problem. Um, I can under the right environment, it's deterministic. From a practical point of view, if I if I took some data off of a server and I ran it through Grok, and I took the the same data off a of server and ran it through Grok a day later. I probably would get slightly different results because the data comes in slightly different orders and the servers have different queues and all these kind of weird stuff going on, it's too hard to figure out. Um, but so hopefully I, I've answered that question. There's, there's nothing um, other than there are some random seeds uh, for determining you know, initial states of connections and things like that. Um, uh, and if you process in the right order, you'll be deterministic. Um, so if you ran on your laptop and you ran the same experiment twice, you get the exact same results. Um, now, on the hardware side, this is a big question: how we can, how can things be accelerated here? Um, I, I don't know if you guys all know this, but there's a bunch of companies right now. We're trying to figure out, very large companies trying to figure out what is the next, you know, substrate for computing in the next, you know, decades. And they're all looking at machine learning algorithms, and they're all trying to figure out neural models. And, and a lot of them are interested in what we're doing. And um, and, and they have very different approaches. There's a guy I know at Sandia National Labs, which is a United States national laboratory, um, and they are he's interested in doing photonics, and that is on-chip photonics, where they're trying to, you know, use light guides and so on. Uh, other people are trying to use different memory types of things. The key to, the, I, I, to answer your question specifically um, is um, the bottleneck is essentially uh, memory and memory transfer, right? There's a lot of memory. We have a lot of connectivity. The bits have to get places. If you look at a human brain, the white matter, which is the, which is the, the wiring, if you will, um, that's the, the big volume of the brain is white matter. It's wiring. It's like the old Cray computer in the back. You ever seen the back of a Cray computer? It's like just tons of wires. Well, that's what the brain is like. And this is the problem because, you know, on the, uh, it's basically a memory architecture which is distributed. And, and how do you build a distributed memory architecture with lots of memory? And I'm not an expert in this field. but in the end, what's going to happen is people are trying to figure out what is the memory architecture that will work best. Is it various bus structures? Is it a distributed CPU and just distributed memory control? Lots of different approaches there. What we hope to accomplish, essentially, what we the, the need for hardware solves several problems. It's just like regular computers. There's a need to make them faster. We run up into that all the time now. We'd love the, our models to be much faster. Um, we, there's a need to make them uh, go embedded. So, like what kind of stuff we're doing with Grok, you you know that takes you know it's a fairly hefty model. And what if I want to embed that in every you know disk drive or every you know um, I/O box or controller, or every everything on the internet, right? Every refrigerator or something like that. Well, that's a pretty heavy thing to run there. So we want to go towards embedded things and low power. So power, size, and speed 
are all going to be critical here. And in the same way that we've struggled with all those in computers for over decades, we're going to be doing the same thing here. And I haven't a clue which architectures are going to win out uh, at this point in time. I don't know. Well, um, Alexander Primak here. I'm PhD in computer science and currently working as a data scientist. And I have a bit practical question. I um, recently got interested in natural language processing, and you showed an amazing example of how neural networks might be used in your development. And I've recently been looking through publications by Thomas Mikolov. He's from Google, and he did also using neural networks, um, well, different to yours, sure, but similar problem. It's word representation in vector space. And what you did is strikingly similar. And what I found very different and amazing uh, is your example of fox eating rodent. And you said that this network hasn't been trained on fox. And this is actually a question, if you can answer to it, how you've been able to present it into network people as it knows the word. Because here, uh, in all of existing research, if we didn't train this word, we don't know its representation in vector space. Yeah. How did you overcome this issue? Uh, so let me t just walk you through it again. So the company SEPT, which is in Austria, they, uh, they came up with this, and you can talk to them and read about it, they came up with a way of creating these sparse representations for words. So although the, the, the CLA did not, was never trained on that word, the, there was training involved in figuring out how to represent the word fox. So there was a representation for the word fox, and that representation was not an arbitrary representation. That representation was a sparse distributed representation where the bits meant something. So if you compared fox to all the other animals, so look, I took the representation of all the other animals that, that, that are in this dictionary, and you would see it shares semantic bits with all of them in different ways. So it, the representation for fox, in some sense, encodes how it's similar to other animals. And so literally when you feed that pattern into the CLA, even though it's never seen the word fox before, it's seen some of the structure of fox. It's seen the bits that are on the word fox have been on in other representations that it has been trained on. It, it, it goes back to that first property of SGR, is there are two patterns that, are, that share bits, have semantic similarity. So by the, the trick of that demo, which blew me away the first time I saw it too, um, was that the, the representation for Fox, although it's unique, it also has, is overlapping in bits with other re animal representations. And so the CLA picks up those similarities and says, oh yeah, well, I, I've never seen this exact pattern, but I, there are parts of it that are very similar to the ones I've seen before. Uh, they're, the same bits are on. So the things that are Fox-like that it's shared with, I don't know, coyote or whatever, who knows. Uh, we're on. So the trick to making that work was that the representations themselves uh, encoded the semantic meaning of the word, and and the CLA was just generalizing um, to something similar to it seen before. It says, "Well, Fox is closest to things I've seen before in this in this way." And I don't know if I've answered that. I don't know if you understood that answer, but if you have satisfied with it, the trick was in the representations themselves. It's not an arbitrary representation. Fox was already similar to other things that it seen. But that was cool in its own right, because SEP figured out how to do that, <laughs> just to make that word dictionary. Cool. Um, one final question? No? OK. So then, you know, I think we all uh, owe Jeff another big hand here. Thank you. Hey, just I don't know if, if there's any more procedural things here, but I, I do want to uh, thank uh, Percentile and Ali for helping arrange this, and the guys at Skills Matter, and Matt Taylor from our end who put this together. And again, I apologize for not being in person, but maybe we'll have some future events uh, that uh, we will be over there. And, uh, and, and I appreciate you guys all coming out on a, I guess it's an evening for you, um, and spending the time. And um, um, I'm very excited and happy you were able to come. So thanks. Much appreciated, and there's uh, I know there's some other plans in the pipeline, and you know engaging more with uh, with Numenta and maybe running a hackathon or something around Newpick or doing something in that space. So, you know, I'm sure uh, there'll be follow-on. So, thank you again.
All right. Bye, guys. Cheers.